thank you kindly, uh, Professor Schultz, for your, your uh, wonderful uh, paper. Um, Tolstoy starts uh, Anna Karenina with the eternal line, all families are happy the same way, but each family is unhappy in its own way. Let's talk about the American family, and let's talk about the varieties of the kinship and social organization structures that comprise the entire range of the American universe. We have um, a, a, a matrifocal uh, African-American uh, kinship and social organization system. We have the systems that flow from the extraordinary demographic changes uh, that uh, have um, been uh, part of the Hispanic and Latin American migration to the United States. We have uh, now the fastest growing sector of the American family are Asian American family. So I wonder if you could reflect upon how you see the varieties in terms of kinship and social organization uh, and what applies to that entire universe that is families of African American origin, families of Hispanic American origin, families of Asian American origin. Thank you. Um, I'm not as familiar with all of those different kinship structures, but I would say that the basic outline of what I've described applies equally um, to every 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 one of the kinship groups that you've described. They're living in the same society with the same lack of support. They do have um, they do have, as as you're alluding to, other sources of informal support um, that are uh, ba based on a, on a broader notion of who should be providing some of the care, the, the, the family, the, the, the larger village that, that creates the family um, is, is available to them. But that's always um, informal. That's always um, unpaid. That's always something that leaves the people who are doing that care work very vulnerable to um, any kind of an economic downturn, any kind of a accident they may have that renders them unable to work, and 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 equally um, equally vulnerable then to um, um, and leaving the children then who are being cared for by these informal systems equally vulnerable to um, to um, 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 lack of care, and um, and in in those communities that we can see also the especially in the African American community. We can see the um, the impact of the lack of social supports from that was described by by Professor Putnam yesterday. I mean, the the, the support that are that is being provided by the people who really need it um, um, for for, um, um, for 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 reasons of their of their of their poverty is inadequate. It's not working. It's not doing anything. So I, I think that the informal um, kinship networks that you're talking about do provide uh, the people who are living through these situations. With um, a lot of support and it, and and probably making them um, more stable and 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 happier in the work that they're doing because they have other people that are helping them and see the value of what they're doing, but it it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't provide any kinds of stability for any of the people that are doing all of that informal work. Uh, thank you both, uh, Sister Helen. Thank you very much, Professor Schultz, for a really illuminating paper. I mean, one of the things I think you really show is that there's this sort of thing out there that we have to conform ourselves to, uh, this set of ideas somehow. Even if, I mean, you, you said uh, people uh, think about, the women especially think about having freedom to shape their identity, but what comes across from your paper is just how little freedom there actually is, you know, in, in this system. Um, and so it's a kind of a social philosophy that's got really distorted, that's not really connecting with, with who we are. And that's why the, the, it's so interesting to hear you see this and try to connect to the common good idea. I mean, I see this in the church too, and I mean, I'm sure you do it, but especially from the point of view of the religious sisters. You know, we've got this massive division in the United States between one group of religious sisters who's really focused on rights for women and this other group who thinks that ideology is terrible and it's anti-Catholic and all, and they just, they're even in separate conferences, you know, they just do not talk to each other. I mean, 
this kind of contrast is just so striking. So I wanted to ask you two questions. One which is sort of um, maybe a sort of chance for how we could see a change on this level. And the other one is a sort of question, I think perhaps less likely to change, but I'd be interested on your comments on it. First of all is, how are we going to change this sort of thing, this sort of ideology that's out there? Well, I think one of the factors is the whole climate change debate, that this could be quite our ally, because if we're going to have to change our behavior to fit with the natural environment, you know, we can't just do what we like to the environment. We have to take it into account, what it is, the way it is. We could start to think, well, maybe we have to do that about ourselves as well, somehow. You know? So a way we think about freedom and all these other things have to change in relation to the kind of beings we are, that we have a kind of nature, if we can say that word. You know, that, and so maybe the whole climate change thing could help to shift you know, the way we're thinking about this. I don't know what you think about that. I'd be interested. The other thing is, in my experience, it's interesting that you're from St. Thomas. I was there in 94 for one year. So this is where I got all my ideas about America. Um, <laughs> uh, the, was, the, was the attitude towards government in the United States. I mean, as a European going there, I just couldn't believe it. You know, so many people gave me the impression that government is like some sort of alien thing that they have to fight against. Or, or, you know, it's something, it's nothing to do with us, you know. And, and hence why, you know, you wouldn't want government involved in any of these things. You don't expect business to be doing the, th the things about supporting maternity care and all that sort of thing. And hence why I would say ultimately we, it's very hard to talk about common good because in the classic Thomistic and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Catholic social thought, the government's primary role is overseeing the common good. Everybody else has to contribute to the common good, but it isn't their primary goal. The only body that has the goal to oversee the common good is the government. Now, if you have this feeling about the government, you're, you, you're going to have a lot of difficulty producing a common good, mm -hmm. I think. So, you know, that, that's just a couple of reflections in, in response to a really interesting paper. Thank you so much for it. Yeah, I love both of those, uh, those, those suggestions and those comments that you've made. Um, on the first question of climate change, I love that idea. Um, I would, uh, we, you know, some, some of us Catholic women who are, who are trying to um, shake women up to make them realize how, how as you described it, how, um, how restrictive and conforming rather than liberating this notion is, um, are, are, are always searching for ways to um, just to, to give our ideas currency in a, in a more popular way. And I, I haven't seen anybody explore the notion of trying to, to, to wed the notion that we don't control the earth, we have to learn to live in it, um, and we have to take drastic steps to do so. I love the idea of trying to translate that into our lives as well. Um, I, I, we've been trying for a long time to try to, just to, to get some currency with respect to just, just n n nature and our bodies and, 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 and um, you know, having people, sh having people sort of, uh, having people perhaps um, um, get some currency with some of the arguments we're trying to make by making them understand that, um, that, that, that our bodies are just being denigrated by being forced to be in one, in, in one, one mode. And that hasn't gone very far, but maybe tying it to uh, global climate change um, will, would, would be a better strategy. And I'm going to bring that back to some of my colleagues and see what we can do with that. I really appreciate that. On your notion of the American government and the common good, um, I think one of the things that I that I say at the beginning of my paper that I illustrate a little bit is that America has a uh, just the common understanding of what the common good is in the United States is 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 pathetic and feeble and has no relation to what we're talking about here. And I think that your explanation for why that is is um, is really insightful. Um, the um, we the the other. The other problem with that, though, is that um, if if it's relegated to the government, it's relegated to politics. So it's relegated to an, uh, a realm that we can only decide by fighting um, about p political offices and fighting political battles and electing people who are in one camp or another. In other words, it's something d deciding and determining what the common good is, is a matter of voting, of politics, of money, of lobbying. It is not something that is done at any kind of a grassroots level. 
And that's one of the reasons why it doesn't have any content. What I try to show is that people use this notion of the common good just to mean, I think, social activism, but it has no real content. And um, um, I don't know what to do about that, but I think that your explanation of it is very, is very, is very helpful and convincing. Lisa, your, your paper has elicited a great many uh, uh, comments and questions of interest. I have six people on our queue right now, but only a few minutes left uh, before we have to go to the next paper. So I will uh, allow one more question and exchange, uh, a question from Pierpaolo Donati, uh, but then I have uh, Vittorio Hussle, Ana Marta, uh, Giuta, and Osvaldo on the list, and we'll return to you uh, during the general discussion at the end of the morning. Pierpaolo. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Shields, uh, for your very brilliant uh, paper. Uh, you show in a very interesting way the different ideas about the common good. Uh, surely the United States uh, welfare state uh, is, uh, in, as I <laughs> would say, is uh, in the Stone Age still because it uh, uh, concerns uh, the family as a private sphere, hobby, as you say. So the commonality, what is common, is sharing the idea that the family means a privacy, means a private reality. So I agree with you that the state should intervene, uh, but it is very difficult, as you know, to, to change uh, the American culture. So uh, I would ask you uh, what could be the role of a civil society uh, in advocating uh, uh, what we call family rights, uh, particularly in my paper, and also in other papers uh, that will be presented here. Um, I'm talking of civil society, of course, and not as an economic market, as a business uh, <laughs> ethics, but the universe of uh, intermediary bodies uh, uh, so civil associations, uh, cooperatives, uh, fund civic uh, foundations, and so on and so forth. Uh, what can be the role of these uh, social networks uh, within civil society in advocating these uh, rights? And another very close uh, question is about uh, your opinion on uh, what we call corporate citizenship. You mentioned in some way uh, the corporate citizenship rights in uh, in your paper. And uh, my question is, from a European perspective, I wonder whether corporate uh, citizenship in the States could be regulated in some way by the state. So on the first question, I think that the role of civil associations, um, what I would like to see happen and what I think that they could do has to be a uh, uh, effort to, to interject into the discourse about policies in the United States some reality, um, some um, reality about the situation of families in the United States and of, of children in particular. I think that um, I think that people will people need to be shaken from seeing all of these issues as political issues that have to be determined by whether you voted for Trump or whether you voted for Obama. Um, it has to be. It has to be seen as a as a, as, a, as a common issue involving the people in the United States. And back to Sister Alford's uh, comments, it, it has to be seen as something that, that that civil society could maybe affect. But the only way to affect it is not through not through thinking that you have to do it through a political argument, but 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 by changing the the conversation. I think that uh, books like like Professor Putnam's that that talk about the reality of. Um, of who is doing what in the United States um, and show that it's really civil, the civil society that's doing most of the things should uh, give them some credibility, some credibility in interjecting themselves in conversations about policy that are apolitical, that are not um, bound by one view of the world or the other in terms of politics, but in the reality of the situation. I would like to see civil society engaging in the political conversation, but not as a political factor, but as a as a as a as a as a as somebody who can speak for um, the the reality of the situation of, of human beings who are living in the United States. Lisa, I'll, I'll have to I'll have to ask you to hold the thought there and to return to it if you don't mind. 
in our general discussion. I, I don't want to intrude too much into the next time here. Thank you so much for what a, a wonderful paper that I'm sure is going to contribute much more to the discussion over the rest of the morning. Thank you.